Hello, Curious Minds, and welcome back to another episode of the Hayas Podcast. I'm your host, Victoria, as always, and I'm thrilled to be back with more science knowledge and two extraordinary new guests. Today, we are diving into the fascinating world of ancient DNA preservation and microstratigraphy with two leading scientists, Matthias Maya and Carolina Mayol. Our first guest is Matthias, a biochemist from the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Matthias is at the forefront of developing cutting edge wet lab methods and advanced DNA sequencing techniques for paleogenomics. In our conversation, we explore the incredible journey of retrieving the oldest DNA ever found, the significance of alternative DNA sources like sediments, and we talk about an intriguing 25,000-year-old case of identifying an individual from ancient DNA found on a pendant, a real-life ancient forensic case, if you will. Our second fantastic guest is Carolina Mayol a geoarchaeologist and professor from the University of La Laguna in beautiful Tenerife. Carolina takes us into the microscopic world of archaeological sediments, revealing how these tiny particles can tell us big stories about the human past. We delve into what these microscopic analyses can reveal about our ancestors' daily lives, and we chat about what is known about the earliest controlled use of fire. Both Matthias and Carolina offer unique insights into how we can uncover the secrets of our ancient history through innovative scientific methods. This episode promises to be both educational and entertaining, providing a glimpse into the fascinating world of paleogenomics and archaeology under the microscope. I want to once again thank you, Matthias and Carolina, for your time and insights. Your work is not only groundbreaking, but also incredibly inspiring. And with that, I leave my audience to our episode. As always, stay curious, stay engaged, and welcome to the Hayas Podcast. Welcome to the Hayas Podcast, Matthias. Thank you for inviting me. I've been looking forward to chatting with you ever since I learned you were joining the seminar series. So I'm really excited. And I think your job description will be exciting for our listeners too. So Matthias, who are you and what is your job? Um, I'm a biochemist, which is actually uh, something that people usually don't get excited about. But I think the subject that I'm working on, which is trying to get DNA out of uh, ancient remains, such as Neanderthals and early humans, is something that many people care about. Um, and it's sort of an interesting job that I have that combines the sort of dry development of methods um, with uh, yeah, interesting questions about the past. You're right. Ever Every time somebody drops Neanderthals or ancient humans or human ancestors, people are like poking up their ears and get excited. So as you mentioned, you're working with very, very old DNA. To be able to analyze this DNA, there is a myriad of methodological steps involved that have to be on the one hand efficient, but on the other hand, also gentle to keep the very, very small amount of DNA that is still, if even present in this material. But to give more context, let's start from the beginning. What are the most common sources we can retrieve ancient DNA from? If you had asked me this question like five years ago or six, seven years ago, I would have said it's, it's bones and teeth, right? Nothing else. This is uh, the one source of ancient human DNA that we have. Now that's becoming more diverse, actually, because since we've found out kind of recently that uh, DNA can also be preserved in the sediments. Uh, and even sometimes on sort of archaeological artifacts. We're going to come back to that because that's a really, really exciting new topic that has emerged in our field. But let's now first stick to the ancient DNA in general. Which limitations are you facing and what's the oldest DNA that has ever been retrieved? I mean, the oldest, yeah, the oldest DNA that has been retrieved so far comes from... Uh, from a mammoth, I think dated to something a bit over a million years. This work was done by another group. Um, um, and so 
the benefit that they had in their work is that they could work with permafrost uh, mm. remains. So frozen. samples, yes, frozen. It's like a perfect sample. This, nature has put this into the freezer a million years ago, and now uh, it came out. Um, now, the environment in which I'm working is also an institute uh, for anthropology, and we are mostly interested in human evolution and the human ancestors and relatives. And there, unfortunately, we didn't really have much success in uh, discovering things in permafrost. There are some examples, actually, as the permafrost is melting, some uh, human bones also come out, and some sometimes they can be also quite old. But so far, there have been no uh, remains of, you know, um, archaic humans, so uh, our extinct uh, relatives that have came, come out of permafrost. So we are limited to uh, the typical uh, climate, um, uh, temp temperate climate that we have, say, in Europe and Asia and most parts. Um, and their DNA preservation at most goes back to f about 400,000 years. This is currently the record. It's a sample from a cave in Spain called the Cima de los Huesos, Pit of Bones. And they are under perfect fridge conditions. So as good as you can be outside of permafrost in a deep cave, permanently 11 degrees year round. There we've gotten some DNA out of some traces of DNA from very early Neanderthal ancestors or relatives. So the perfect condition to preserve ancient DNA or DNA in general, as you mentioned, is temperature. And which other factors could contribute to the good preservation of DNA? I think it's really mostly temperature. Uh, pH can be a factor, so if uh, things are acidic, acidic, acidic environments do not preserve uh, DNA well, but they also do not preserve bones well. From a biochemical point of view, what is happening to the DNA after um, an organism dies? Yes. So at first there's a phase at which uh, enzymes in the, in the body, nucleases, they would uh, cut down the DNA in the cells. So shortly after the death of an organism, the cell DNA already starts being degraded. Any DNA that sort of escaped this uh, initial uh, um, stage of degradation then has a chance to be bound by, uh, for example, the bones in the body. So, and there's something very amazing about the uh, humans, or generally about the skeleton, uh, which is that it consists of both a, a mineral and the protein component, the protein is collagen. This is what's used for dating often in archaeology. The mineral component, hydroxyapatite, has really great DNA binding capacities. So any DNA that would be uh, sort of uh, hitting a bone has, has a good chance of being bound there and then remaining bound to the bone for a very long uh, period of time. And from that point on degradation, it sort of is much, much slower. It's a spontaneous... Uh, a uh, chemical process, uh, uh, hydrolytic reactions happening with that kind of humidity that's uh, around the fossil, but it goes very slow. You've already dropped the keyword, which was mineral, uh, when you talked about hydroxyapatite, which is one of the main components of bone. So the DNA can be bound by this mineral and in that case protected. And that leads us to the field that you've already talked about or scratched the surface before. I am talking about the successful extraction of ancient DNA from archaeological sediments. This is something that has emerged probably in the last 10 years and has been researched and successfully published. Could you please tell us more about this approach and what's the benefits of sediment ancient DNA? To illustrate the relevance of studying sediment DNA, just imagine being an archaeologist um, and excavating a site, a Stone Age site. And these excavations often involve teams of, you know, a few senior archaeologists, many students, and they then excavate over the course of years, sometimes decades. And very often at these sites, you unearth thousands of artifacts that would sort of testify human presence there. Um, you see fireplaces. Um, but very rarely would you actually find the remains of the people who've actually used the site. Um, and this can be hugely frustrating because you have an archaeological record that you cannot really match to a, uh, um, to a specific group of people. 
And this is where sediment DNA comes in. So what we are beginning to do is, um, after we've discovered a few years ago that uh, in addition to, to DNA from fauna, so from like the food that people process at sites, uh, you know, bones of like bovids and, 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 and horses and et cetera, uh, uh, we also do find the DNA of the people who lived at the site in the sediment, at least in a very small proportion of the samples that we analyze. And this then gives us an opportunity to uh, start linking the archaeological assemblages of uh, layer by layer at the site with a genetic profile. And then we can compare this genetic profile to the genetic profiles we uh, obtained from, from skeletal remains, from the same or other places. And we can, of course, also link profiles from different sites to each other and see if there a turnover of, of, of populations. If there's a turnover, say, in the archaeology that you find, so in, this, in the tools that were manufactured, is there also a turnover in population also that the same people continue to produce uh, or started making different tools? So one of the main benefits is that you're minimally or basically not at all invasive if you think about um, skeletal remains. Because before that, we tried to be minimally invasive, but we still had to, in some way, shape or form, damage the organic material that was left. So for example, you could drill into the inner ear part or drill into other bones or extract from teeth. So that's like one of the main points that could give you access to sites where A, there are no skeletal remains retrieved at all, or you cannot get access. And probably, if you think about sediments, if that was a horizon where people and animals lived on, there was deposited a lot. So what is the common theory or the common state of the knowledge right now where this DNA comes from in the sediment? Maybe if I'm allowed to sort of first divert a little bit and go back to the destructiveness of sampling. So I think it's important to keep in mind still that even though we can get some DNA, human DNA from sediment, that's very exciting. It's not the same quality uh, and not the same level of resolution that we would get from bones. So it continues to be that the analysis of skeletal elements is, is critical. And oftentimes, actually, the damage that is done in DNA sampling is is is, uh, is quite little. Mm. Just compared to radiocarbon dating, it's like for many years, and I think this is slowly changing now. But it was it was like the norm to take like half a gram of material, which is a lot. So, you know, sometimes you see bones that have like literally like uh, cuts made into them and a little piece cut out. When we do DNA sampling, we we often uh, find uh, parts of the um, uh, of the bone or a tooth where there's a natural break site, and we take a very small sample, sometimes just as little as 10 milligrams. It's like a millimeter diameter. Um, so it's actually not that destructive. Mm. To, it's just so that one doesn't get the wrong impression that, uh, um, that that sediment DNA can be a replacement for all sort of all other genetics work on 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 on, on uh, skeletal remains. Um, both, I think, together, this is where the power sits. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. That's definitely true. You cannot get to the same resolution at this stage of the research. And it's not a re- meant as a replacement, but sometimes if in some layers you cannot identify any skeletal material, then, of course, sediment DNA comes in handy to get like an idea of the whole profile. Exactly. Yeah, this is exactly where the power sits of this method. And there are sort of other complementary approaches that are taken. Also here at the University of Vienna, Katharina Dukas' group, she's sort of doing a lot of uh, identification of small little bone flakes, so things that you cannot really Mm -hmm. do much with. You don't even know which species they are from. And sort of she's taking a proteomics approach to identify uh, 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 fragments that may be of human origin. And in fact, actually using this approach, she's identified one of the most exciting bones that was ever discovered, I would say, uh, from the Nisova cave, which is a hybrid. Of a, so this little bone fragment belonged to a hybrid of a Neanderthal and a Denisovan, which is sort of an amazing find. So there are uh, many routes to getting interesting data, genetic data from archaeological material. Yeah, it's getting really interesting at this point. Could you please explain the difference between DNA sequencing and proteomics? I mean, it's it's targeting a different molecule, right? Uh, the DNA, the uh, the DNA, the genome. It's built of DNA, and this is the sort of um, um, 
building instruction for our organism, right? It's sort of the complete set of information what makes a human or what makes any sort of uh, uh, organism is encoded in the genome. Now, a part of this DNA is then sort of actively uh, read in the cell and translated into into proteins, which then have a function in the cell. So, um, and in general, like if you want to maximize the information that you can get about an uh, about an individual or a species, you want to have the complete genome. Now, the problem is that even though DNA is a relatively stable molecule, there are limits to uh, DNA survival. We discussed earlier about 400,000 years is the oldest human DNA sequence. A million years or a bit more than a million is like a, a, a mammoth. Now, if you want to go deeper back in time, uh, then this is where proteins become interesting um, because it has been shown that proteins on, on like long geological timescales can survive longer than DNA. And so I think once you leave the... Uh, the, or you go beyond the limits of DNA preservation, then there is sort of the proteomic, the pro, uh, proteome is, is there for you to maybe get some information that you couldn't get otherwise. But as a DNA person, I would, of course, always argue that really what you want is the genome and not the proteome, which you automatically get sort of as a side product of the genome, if you can get one. Noted. <laughs> so... As I asked you earlier, we were talking about the preservation of DNA in the sediment. I was asking you, where does this DNA come from and how the hell can it be preserved for such a long time? Okay, I evaded this question once. I have to try to evade sorry, this question. I'm sorry, really, no, I have to ask sorry. you the difficult no, no. questions today, Matthias. I, was, Mathias. Ju I was, was just trying to uh, be funny. So I think the question of what the source of DNA in sediment is, is still very open. We've tried to look at this in a, on a micro scale. So we've been teaming up with uh, geoarchaeologists who uh, do something very amazing to sediment, which is that they embed it in a plastic. So you can basically drown a block of sediment in a, in a liquid plastic, then it hardens and you can cut it. Um, and you have a fully uh, uh, preserved block of sediment. And we drilled microscopic uh, samples or small samples into this, uh, specifically targeting things that look like small bone fragments, things that look that the archaeologists or geoarchaeologists identified as uh, feces, called coprolites, and uh, compared the DNA preservation in these different elements. And it turns out that both these, uh, these uh, elements, bone fragments and coprolites, are good sources of DNA. But we also do find DNA in parts of these blocks where you have nothing visible, no visible structures that just look like background, like matrix. And so it's likely that there's also just a mineral uh, in the sediment. So the sort of dust that is blown into a cave can also bind DNA as people uh, maybe urinate, people spit. My I really wonder at times if spitting isn't a big source of DNA. If, you know, when I had like little kids and I just saw them, you know, uh, spitting all day and saliva dropping out. I'm wondering that must have been the same in a cave back in the day, right? So maybe, and, and, and when you want to have your own DNA sequence, what you actually do is you spit into a tube and you send it to 23andMe or some other company. So um, I can imagine that spit may be a, a, one of the main component, uh, main origins of, of sediment DNA. It's very hard to, uh, be, to, to be conclusive about this yet. And I think this is the next years will hopefully bring more insights about what the actual sources are. That's an interesting idea with the spitting. I've never thought about that because you think about it as like such a instable material, probably that it would, how would this survive if you sometimes are not even able to retrieve DNA from skeletal remains but yeah it's a it's an interesting theory i mean it has been shown that dna when it's bound to a mineral such as hydroxyapatite is protected and shielded by this mineral and it degrades uh, uh slower mm -hmm. and the same mechanism could work with spit like uh, the dna from the spit binds to clay for example which is usually abundant uh, in a sediment and then also there, uh, it will be protected from nucleases that are like proteins that digest DNA. Um, and, it, and it's conceivable that it would be bound for tens of thousands of years or even longer. 
now that we've learned from you that a mineral can act as a protective thing to DNA, that totally makes sense. Also, you've mentioned hydroxyapatite, which is a component in bone, but also a mineral. And we've seen from a very interesting study that I've mentioned here before on this podcast, um, that bone itself, in this case, a bone ornament, a pendant, could serve as a, a protective mineral to protect even other DNA than the endogenous DNA from which this bone tool was made of. Could you talk about that a little bit, please? There's a fascinating possibility. Or one of the most interesting things in archaeology is to link uh, cultural records with genetic records, right? To understand who made what. And in sort of later archaeology, say in the Holocene, if you have uh, burials, there it can be easy. You do find the skeleton of a person, you do, do find grave goods, and you kind of know these objects are associated with the person. You can, you can sequence the genome of the person, and then you have a really clear picture. Now you go back to the Paleolithic, to sort of the uh, Ice Age people. And uh, there it's much trickier because burials were largely absent, so burials were rare. And it's indeed, I think, uh, contentious if uh, Neanderthals, for example, bu uh, buried their people. There are some suggestions, but I think none of this is like 100% clear. Um, and so any archaeology that you find is not linked to a person. And f for this you can... Uh, you, uh, you, sometimes you are lucky and you do find a skeleton sort of uh, in the same layer as you find certain artifacts, then, okay, you can link at least on a sort of broad time scale the uh, DNA from the skeleton to the artifacts. With sediment DNA, this just becomes much more frequent that we can do this. So now we, we have a much higher chance for any uh set of artifacts that we might get some human dna from the sediment even if there's no bones we still get it from the sediment and we can start linking the archaeology to the sort of genetic profile of people which is great but the even more exciting would be actually to take this a step further and uh and link a single object to a single individual and this is what we've tried in this particular case so we were wondering, might it be possible that the DNA of the user of an artifact might still be sticking on that artifact? It's a bit like a forensic investigation, but going back tens of thousands of years. And um, we developed some special method that uh, can isolate DNA from the surface of bone and tooth artifacts. So not stone tools, but artifacts made out of animal bones. Um, and then applied it to a set of, uh, of such artifacts. And one of them was particularly exciting and came from Denisova Cave, um, which is a cave in southern Siberia and Russia that is sort of a, a very interesting history of exciting finds. Um, and this uh, um, artifact is a, is, a, is a tooth, a deer tooth with a hole that was pierced into it and was probably used... Uh, on a necklace or worn around uh, a pendant that was worn around the neck or on the arm or somewhere. Um, and the archaeologists there actually gave us this pendant without cleaning it first. So they, when they discovered the pendant in the, uh, in the sediment, they took it out with gloves and put it in a bag and uh, gave it to us in Leipzig. Uh, and then we applied this method of isolating DNA without destroying the actual artifact and looked for human DNA and to our sort of surprise, we were actually able uh, when, um, to, to find quite a bit of human DNA um, in this pendant and we could uh, generate a, a very good genetic profile of the individual who used or made this pendant and turns out she was a woman and she lived 20 to 25,000 years ago. Um, and her DNA sort of roughly matches the DNA also of other ancient human individuals that were characterized by analyzing their bones. But the first time now we got sort of the a very nice and complete genetic profile of a person, but just from an object that uh, she used. As organic material is more porous than stone tools, probably the DNA can like leach, it's, leach is probably not the right word to use, but go into deeper layers and be protected there. Yeah, that's what we think. And indeed, the method that we use to extract the DNA, we sometimes compare to a washing machine because essentially we put in an agent, phosphate, that at least in the past also used to be part of a laundry reagent. I think now it's not allowed anymore. 
And then we uh, kind of have several, like we continue to wash it, but increasing the heat, like mm -hmm. going from a cold wash to a hot wash. So from like room temperature up to 90 degrees. And it's really in that last sort of hot wash that all the human DNA came out. I love the analogy with the washing machine, because if you really want to get your sheets clean, you're also washing it at 90 degrees, so. Exactly, <laughs> the, the most interesting things come out at 90 degrees. So now that we learned more about sediment ancient DNA, do you think applying this method to older layers in excavation sites that we will be able to retrieve the DNA of older hominin species that we have yet to retrieve DNA from? I think it would be very hard to get DNA from uh, very old artifacts. So we have no, we've shown now once that you can get the DNA from the user or maker of an artifact. We hope to show it again and sort of expand our sort of uh, catalog of uh, artifacts that have a genetic profile associated with them. Um, what I really th makes me hopeful is uh, sediments as a source of DNA, because uh, we know that when we go down in the past, when once you reach about 100,000 years, DNA preservation becomes very sporadic. So many of the objects that we were bones saying that we would try would, would have no DNA, a few do. Um, but unfortunately, they so it is a numbers game. So the more you try, the you know, you need to try many different uh, samples so that you identify the few that are positive. Now, there are only so many human bones that you can test, right? And when they are so old, they're also particularly precious. And this is, I think, where sediment DNA comes in that you can uh, have like an endless collection of sediment samples from many sites, uh, independent of mm. the finds of any human skeletons, um, and just see if they contain DNA. And, and you can even take this a step further and, uh, uh, and first ask, okay, where in the world should I actually get my sediments from so that the DNA preservation is sort of likely to be there? And places like the Nisova Cave, for example, are amazing for this. DNA preservation goes back a few hundred thousand years. There might be other sites in, in, in southern Siberia. Where you might have Homo erectus being there a few hundred thousand years ago and where DNA preservation might allow uh, this DNA to still be around. So I have hopes for this from sediments. Could you give us an approximate idea of, maybe in percentages, how many sediment samples were successful in retrieving hominin or mammalian DNA in the, at Denisova Cave? Well, at Denisova Cave, uh, I think we screened more than 700 samples and they were almost all positive for faunal DNA. So but mammalian DNA in general, 95% or so. That's exceptional, right? Um, it's not uncommon that at a given site, uh, well, sediments are really a very rich source of uh, faunal DNA. And so if the DNA preservation conditions allow, so if the cave is cold enough, and if the layers where you look are not too old, then it's, not, it, it's very common that every sample that you analyze contains tons of hyena, bear, bovid DNA. What's really rare is the human component. And there, the success rate sort of varies between zero. So we have sites where we've analyzed 300 samples and didn't find a single one with ancient human DNA. Extremely disappointing. Often, these are exactly the things that you would be most interested in, who made this peculiar technology where we really invested heavily and we didn't get anything. Um, but on average, I would say, across all the samples that we've tested, maybe around 5 to 10% of the samples where there's any DNA preserved, so any mammalian DNA preserved, would also have some traces of human DNA. It's not only a game of numbers in that sense, in the sense of numbers of samples, but also numbers in a financial aspect. You showed us this grid, the way you sample in a profile at an excavation site. I think it was even Denisova Cave, and you said you sampled or you tested 700 samples. That's a really large amount of samples, and in terms of um, lab time and consumables. So these are huge projects. You mentioned during your talk that you're already working and have been working on the optimization of these lab methods and how to maybe even parallelize steps in the lab. So that's also a big part of your research that you're doing that is also very, very needed. 
and we're basically waiting for your papers to come out and then to read them and try to come up with new solutions in the lab. So you're having a really big impact on how this field is going, I think. That is very kind, and I take this as a compliment, but I think one should not neglect the role of the biotechnology companies, actually. I think really yes. what's been driving this field is sequencing technology, right? I mean, like yes. 20 years, or when is it, like... 2005 or four or five was sort of the year where the first high throughput sequencer became sort of commercially available. That's just almost 20 years ago, right? And uh, back in the day, you could do 96 DNA sequences in on an instrument in a few hours. Now we do billions, right? This is absolutely incredible. And this is the an achievement that comes from biotechnology. So much of what we do, you know, to also... Uh, uh, be realistic is that we kind of use these uh, enormously potent technologies and then try to sort of uh, stir them in a way that they kind of serve our uh, our questions, mm. right? And our and, and ancient DNA is an interesting niche because usually technology is not developed for highly degraded pieces of DNA. It's more developed for high throughput uh, uh, screen, like for um, medical screening, so jo whole genome sequencing or uh, um, uh, screening for for, for pathogens, etc. Sort of ancient DNA is a is a, is this particular niche, and and it's actually great. So then we who have an interest in in anthropology and our past, uh, we can we can use these technologies and and, and mm. do something great with them. I actually had a question about exactly that, but I skipped it because we have a very tight schedule here that was about uh, the sequencing technologies and how they have skyrocketed. And just going back a couple of years in the early 2000s where the Human Genome Project mm. has started and has produced the first human genome. And then ever since then, I mean, that was just a jump into new methods. And it's crazy how that field has progressed. Yes, and I think I think what's really it's an interesting time right now. If I can come back to a question that I didn't really answer before, please. Um, it's, now we start to learn sort of what what the value of the molecular record is of archaeological sites. Right, people were completely unaware of this. Uh, just you know, a few decades ago. This is why now we have all these collection of fossils. Uh, that have been heavily touched, you know, are heavily contaminated on the surface, which makes our work harder. Now, or glued, the, or glued, yes, terrible, like uh, boiled in some sort of bone glue made from, uh, yeah, sheep or bovid, yeah. Um, and so we are now learning that actually even the sediment is a is an important molecular resource. And I think with this in mind, we can start collecting samples, right? Making mm -hmm. sure that the sediments are not just disposed, but that we keep records both in in these kind of micromorphology blocks that I mentioned earlier, where the sediment is impregnated, but also loose sediment samples for future generations of scientists. And yes, right now the analysis is very expensive. But as the technology is progressing, just what we've seen in the last 20 years, I mean, just think that forward 20 years, I think it will be no problem to scan thousands or tens of thousands of samples for very little money. And then all these, uh, this material that has been collected and secured now becomes very valuable. I totally agree. We have plenty of loose sediment samples here, <laughs> but I'm running out of time. <laughs> I'm looking forward to these methods actually being ready to use. So I knew I was going to ask you a hundred questions and I could continue for another hour, but let's move on to our listener questions. The first one says, looking back, what was the profoundest moment of your career? Yeah, I think maybe when we, when we applied very sensitive lab methods that we've developed in the group to some material that I thought is really too old for DNA preservation, which uh, was actually a bare bone from Cima de los Huesos, this site in Spain that later gave us the DNA from very early Neanderthals. And I think when I got the sequences, the first sequences, and I really saw some bare DNA sequences, uh, from that sample that I thought is way too old, I think that's probably the most exciting moment of my career because it was also the immediate outcome of like methods improvements. The next two questions 
are lovely because they say, how can one join your working group? And then I feel like from the same person, not a question, but I'm a fan of your research and always read your newest papers ASAP. <laughs> that's very, that's very nice. I, I'm that's fascinating. Actually, we have a PhD program and I we just had a call for applications and I feel I'm getting less applications than other groups, like the ones working on ancient pathogens, for example, they are like really? getting dozens of applications. And if I have like you know, 10 people who would sort of name me as one of the potential groups they would like to work with. Um, I may be exaggerating a little bit, but I mean, clearly, uh, you know, it's easy to apply and we're always looking for, uh, for enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastic young researchers. So, so don't it's not too back. hard. Just apply. Just write an email. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moving on to our Hayas Quick Takes. Are you ready for this? Okay, let's see if I am. What was your least favorite subject at school and why? Uh, art, like, but you know, painting and mm. drawing and I just have no skills. A hobby of yours? Gardening and, and that. building and building like uh, wooden things in the garden. I'm setting up my Hochbeet at the yes. moment, so I Lovely. can totally oh, we relate. Can. We should have a chat about that. <laughs> What's your favorite mantra or quote? Maybe think positive. And I'm sort of sometimes need to remind myself of that. Me too. I really need this mantra right now <laughs> towards the end of my PhD. But I think everyone can relate. Everyone in academia can relate to that part of academia. Now, the last segment we always do is called Speakers Ask Speakers. And one of our podcast and here seminar series guests has left this question for you. Who would you consider your most important role model and why? So I've had the pleasure to be working with uh, Svante Pebo for like throughout my postdoc and, uh, and, and group leader phase. And he's really been an amazing scientific mentor and I think in many ways also a role model in terms of like thinking outside the box asking interesting questions but also in like how do you run a group or I mean he obviously runs a bigger operation like a department or at times a whole institute but yeah I think uh, he's definitely sort of left a big impression on how I do work and I think also on many others in the department. Where can people find you online? Uh, not on social media. I think I don't understand how people have, have spent so much time on social media. The day is too short. Uh, really, I think uh, there's a web page which is sort of poorly maintained. Um, and emails, is, uh, that is easy to find my email address. All right. And Matthias, last thing. Is there anything you feel like I didn't ask you today? Anything you feel like you would like to add? No, I think given the time, it was an interesting conversation. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias, for joining us for the Heas podcast today. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you for taking the time. And thank you for taking the time. forward to chatting more about the planters and <laughs> gardening. Thanks, Matthias. <laughs> Carolina, welcome to the Heas podcast. Very happy to be here. Thank you. I'm excited to have you as a guest because we haven't really spoken about microstatigraphy so much on here, which is one of your specialties in your field. And could you please introduce yourself and tell us what your job is? Um, well, I'm Carolina Mayol. I'm a, a researcher and a professor in University of La Laguna in Tenerife in the Canary Islands. I've been there for around 14 years, and my specialty is geoarchaeologist, uh, geoarchaeology, and specifically microstratigraphy. So, I, what we do in microstratigraphy is to do a very um, detailed analysis of uh, the the sediment or the soil uh, in order 
So we are pay a lot of attention to things, little things, very little things, being in the relationship between them, in the context and the order and the sequencing between little things. Because, you know, we are studying the past, prehistory, and the past and the present is really one thing leads to the other. So we are trying to deconstruct that past uh, by looking at the relationship between things. And then the answer will lie in those relationships. That's basically, in a nutshell, (laughs) what I do. That's a good first step into the field, because I was going to ask you, could you Give us an idea what the difference between general archaeology and microstratigraphy is. Yeah, well, general archaeology, you have to imagine um, people scraping soil and finding things, right? And then they try to understand those things and put them together. Um, Geoarchaeologists and stratigraphers, what they what they do is to try to understand that soil. We're like um dirt detectives if you want so it's called stratigraphy because the um, the um, human life is ordered in layers we excavate layers and the layers are strata each of the layers is a stratum so a stratigraphy is the study the study of those layers the study of the strata and microstratigraphy gets each individual layer and squeezes out everything about it. So it uses different techniques to observe and analyze everything that's in there. Because sometimes by just digging a site, you miss most of the information. You toss it in a bucket and that soil contains everything you want to know. So your story is going to remain very simple if you just, especially the more you go back in time. So if you go back to the Paleolithic, where there's only bones and stones, and you try to find meaning and reconstruct people's lives and uh, family relationships and culture change, very complex things that societies have, diet, just based on those two things, it's going to be very difficult. And you might miss out on on the big picture, for example. And uh, what we do is try to get more clues, basically, to complement the big things with studying the soil contents. Archaeologists, as you mentioned, usually dig in like squares and then they have a bucket where they have to put all the soil that they just took from like the surface and put that into the bucket. And then the remains or like everything that they dug up will be then examined from this bucket. But you said you're trying to keep things in order. Can you explain how you how you do that? Yeah, so what what we do is we um, kind of isolate little areas where sh- archaeologists should not work. We we like delimit, you know, a block, and mm-hmm. we we say don't excavate here, and then we leave a little tower, a little sample, a block that should not be touched, and then we uh, wrap it in, with with plaster. And that plaster keeps it together so that we can take it out and carry it to our labs intact. And once it's in the lab, we work with resins to plastify that block because the sediment inside is full of void space. There's porosity in it. So we can fill that porosity with resin and it plastifies the context. We plastify pieces of the site. And once it's plastic, it's it's solid, we slice it like ham, you know, we get slices of it. And from those slices, we make thin sections. And then that's our universe. Then we go to the microscope and we are analyzing a little bit of that archaeological site. We also see microstrata, you know, that what in the site looked like a single layer It's many different little layers together, one after the other, and each of those represents time, relevant time, maybe a hundred years or so. So we Mm -hmm. analyze, we do archaeology under the microscope. Then there is other uh, colleagues who are also geoarchaeologists and use other techniques. And they, for example, collect loose samples of the same place and then do other things like organic analysis, magnetic analysis, and then we complement each other and try to provide clues, that's what we do. 
You showed some very impressive pictures of these resin blocks that you look under the microscope in your talk today. So maybe we could put one or two um, into our podcast for the people to see. Sure. Because it's truly like a new universe opening up. I have a colleague in my office, actually, who also works on that. And he also always shows me his very cool pictures. You can play around with the light as well. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And it's also fascinating what you can uncover from these slides then, because you can identify certain components in the sediment, right? Could you tell us about that a bit more, please? Yeah, you can identify components and then uh, you can also identify processes. So okay, tell us, what, what can we learn? Yeah, you, so components meaning the things, right? The things that might be in there are things that are left behind by humans, like the microscopic bits of their life. You know, like you eat bread in the morning and you don't realize, but there's breadcrumbs everywhere. And you think you're clean, but you're not that clean. And I will see that, you know, because crumbs are one millimeter. One millimeter in a thin session is gigantic. I normally, the things that I see are sub-millimetric. They're like one quarter of a millimeter. And I can still identify whether it's a piece of meat, a piece of bone, a piece of rock. And so we're talking about the elements that are like the trash of human life, but also the environment. Because in the prehistory, people were not like us. They lived in nature. They lived outside. And their world was very natural. So you have, um, normally in these sediments, you have little bits of plant remains and little bits of life that have nothing to do with the humans, that, but they're part of their world. So that you mm -hmm. can try to imagine more accurately a better picture of their environment, their surroundings, and try to figure out if they were outdoors or indoors. Sometimes we're looking at a cave that was collapsed and it's no longer a cave, but was a cave in the time that the people were there. And we can see if that was the case. We can see if they're inside or outside, for example. We can see uh, little pieces of glass called phytolids, which is the inside of the plants that have a distinct shape depending on what plant they are. So a grass phytolids is different than a flower phytolid. And if you have flowers, it means it was the spring. So you have you have a lot of little clues that can link, give you very interesting information. Sometimes you can have, for example, when I was telling you processes, processes I mean things that happen that leave a trace. For example, uh, if if it rains and there is puddling, what puddles do is that they kind of is is they settle sediment and they organize it so that you can tell that there was a puddle there. And if you have puddling or flooding, for example, you have to be aware because water moves things. So for example, you have an archaeological site, uh, and say a Neanderthal site with bone, and the, bo the density of bone and charcoal is not so much. They, they could float. So if you have, for example, a flood episode, and then the entire cave space floods, whatever bones and charcoal is lying around there is going to move around because they will float on the water, move a bit, and then end up in a different place. And the archaeologists would never know that. If they just excavate their bone and say, this bone was tossed here, and I look at the thin section and I see that there was water there, I will say, well, maybe not. Maybe it was tossed somewhere else. So be careful with your interpretation. So it's very important that we work together as a team. And then we discuss and there's feedback between the, all the kinds of information, um, processes, components, and the, the different scales, the scale, the big scale where they work at and the small scale where we work at. The resolution of information you can get to is amazing. Thanks for that private lecture. <laughs> I was really fascinated now just listening to you. I wasn't aware that even in processes where like the actual process, which is water in your example, is not present anymore, you can still determine like the force that brought the pieces together and from this organization of the fragments that they that you find them in can deduce the processes. It's really amazing. 
Another process or activity that you can determine, as you mentioned, is trampling. And that leads us back to archaeological or Paleolithic fire, which is a topic I'm so interested in, and I hope our listeners are too. So let's switch gears to archaeological fire. What's the oldest evidence of controlled fire that we have, or controlled fire use, I have to say, and who was the user? This is still a hot topic of debate. It's very difficult. It's a very difficult thing to find out, to, to figure out if you, when you have evidence of fire in a human context, it's very difficult to determine whether it was controlled or not. If you only have one instance, if you have the luck, which we don't have, of having an, a region or, or say a, a group of sites in a similar time period that consistently show evidence of fire, you could say that is controlled fire. But if you only have one or an isolated instance here and another one there, and you have fire, then you really have to show the relationships, the for example, you have to show that you have the intention of making the fire, right? That you have something that could be fuel that was lit on fire, for example, wood, and you have wood ash, or that you have bone and you have burned bone in relation to some kind of structure. Mm -hmm. But when you only have isolated elements, it's very difficult. And in the very old time periods like as old as more than a million with Homo erectus, for example, there are cases where there is debate around some evidence that looks like fire. For example, some patches of reddish soil that looked like were burned that had high temperatures, they were analyzed. And indeed, they were burned at high temperatures. You know, you can analyze the clay, the minerals in the clay change their composition when they're burned after 600 degrees. So if you find that change, you know that that is not just red, it does is fired. Mm -hmm. But uh, does it have to be intentional? You know, is there anything, any other process that can burn, that can burn soil, clay, for example? Um, Observations show that wildfires don't really burn soil to make it red because they really travel fast. It's fire that moves really fast and it burns vegetation as it goes along and it goes sideways, but it doesn't really stay in one place so that the clay below burns. But maybe you have a tree that burns and then a tree is very static. So if you, the whole tree burns, while the tree is burning, the soil underneath and around the tree is going to get super hot. And maybe that changes the clay mineralogy. And maybe after one million years, you have a little bit of reddening and it's patchy. So it's very tricky. You know, mm -hmm. that's the, there is studies that show that, for example, a site in Kobe Fora, it's called Kobe Fora in Africa, in East Africa, in Kenya, uh, shows such a thing, reddened patches. But there they also have tools, stone tools and bones that seem to show some burning. So is that control of fire? Or is that a uh, wildfire that for some reason got that burned? You know, we, we only have isolated cases. We have another case in South Africa called Wonderwerk, which is a big cave, also very old, uh, more million year old. And it's very deep inside where we have some barn bone and uh, how could you, how could you, a wildfire reach so deep inside the cave? You know, mm -hmm. it's impossible. So it must be controlled. But is it impossible? Maybe there was another entrance to the cave and, you know, oxygen loves, oxygen and flame go together. So if you have a lot of open space uh, with oxygen and there's a fire in the entrance, maybe the heat and the flame can be funneled in very deep and, burn something. It's very difficult to, that debate is constantly open. And for those very old time periods, it's, it's very difficult to show it. But there are those examples, I'm telling you. And then as we move along, there's very old evidence of fire in uh, the Near East, in Israel, and around 400,000 years ago. 
in a cave, in a cave called Kesem Cave. And there we seem to have what we call the traditional fireplace. So it's a concentration, a circle with a concentration of ash that we recognize as wood ash. We have done microscopic work so that it's, it looks like that is the hard, solid evidence of a fireplace, like the oldest fireplaces would be there. And then from then on, then we have again patchy evidence until we get to the late Neanderthals around 60,000 years ago or so, where we just start finding it everywhere. So then it's, it's really common in that time. Thanks for this detailed overview. And the question that I was constantly posing myself in my head was, isn't there also a difference between control, the controlled use of fire and also the making of fire? Because what I remember reading like 10 years ago probably is that also you can make use of fire, of naturally occurring fire, and then take it with you to the cave or wherever and then make use of it. So are there, is there any evidence pointing towards when we started or hominins started making fire on their own? That is also another hot debate. And that is another very difficult debate because um, to prove that you make fire, you have to find evidence of the fire starter. Mm. To you, whatever you use to start the fire, that's what proves that you made the fire instead of grabbing it from a natural source and keeping it and carry it around. So, um, you know, fire starters like pyrite or uh, mu dried mushrooms or people have come up with ideas of dried what... Mushrooms? Yeah, some dried <laughs> mushrooms that sometimes grow on bark or so and they're dried and maybe they're very good for tinder. Yeah, that makes sense. But the problem is that all if you're looking for the residues of those things and if they're organic and you burn them, of course, if they, they, they're tinder, it's the first thing to burn completely. So there's no residues you're going to find above it. So it's very difficult to find the, the fire starter. There, there is some research, interesting research that um, proposes that the, the back of some kind of flint tools, like biface flint tools, have some marks, like parallel marks, mm -hmm. that have been proposed as uh, platforms on which you strike to get sparks going and then hit the sparks on the fires. But this has only been shown, um, well, they have the tools with the marks, and then they have done experiments that show that when you do sparks, you produce those marks experimentally. But it's still not the smoking gun. It's not, it's not yeah. the fi related direct evidence of the fire. So it's very difficult. So that's still an open topic. It's still up for research. That's very yeah. interesting. Pretty cool research. Let's move on to our listener questions because some are related to what we've already talked about. Okay, let's go back to the archaeological sediment and maybe Microstrat can answer that question. Um, the question is, in which part of the archaeological sediment does DNA preserve the best? And do we know? We actually don't know and that's why there's a lot of research going on there right now and is very promising because what we know is that it does preserve. It preserves in the sediment, we know it, we have extracted it, and um, we are trying to see if it's um, related to clay type, you know, to the types of clay because the clay uh, have very specific uh, chemical properties. They, they bond, you know, with the it's it's a question of polarity and the cations in the molecule of the clay that bind to things mm. more easily than to others. And to DNA, it seems to be that is a good match. But beyond that, we are trying to explore that. And um, what is very interesting to me from from as as a micro micro stratigrapher is that we are trying to explore that um, from the blocks of the thin sections. Because we, that is where we can see everything in its place. We can see the relationships of things, so we can target in, sp in the very small space, we can target the clay, target the bone, and then the more data we collect there, we will get closer to understanding where the DNA signature is best preserved and where we, can, we should sample it and where not. But for sure, it's preserved. We know it, and we are opening that Pandora box now 
Uh, for fires is not such good news because when you burn DNA uh, already at 300 degrees or so, it's lost. So even if you have the fire, the, the soil below the fire already gets to that temperature. And the soil below the fire, which is the living floor where all the DNA would be, uh, would be lost there. So fire and DNA, they don't get along very well. But sediments, yes. And what do you think is the main source of DNA? Where does it come from? Is it like feces, urine, blood? I don't know. You tell me, please. Yeah, I'm not a DNA expert at all, but I think that is a combination of all those things. I think, yeah. yes, I think just by the pre human presence in a place that we shed a lot of DNA. <laughs> we yeah, probably. I'm, I'm giving a, a talk on Wednesday and one of my last slides is like, um, be aware your DNA is just everywhere, you know, because I had to explain, I gave that talk to my dad and was like, is that like boring? Or can you tell me, can you evaluate this talk? And he was like, yeah, it's, it's okay. But what I do not understand is like, where's the DNA coming from? We were talking about, um, a stalagmite that enclosed some DNA where DNA could be extracted and then determined or assigned to different species. Um, for example, bear. And he was like, how did that happen? Like, did the bear rub on the stone? Did he pee on the stone? So like, these are valid questions. And then it preserves for such a long time. Also, like the residues of the breakfast you're having that you mentioned in the beginning that are smaller than a millimeter. That's insane to me that this preserves over this long period of time. It's incredible what we can learn yes. from that. Very, very promising. You field. have to think, though, that the remember what I said that the the sediment has lots of porosity. It mm -hmm. has void space. So, you know, as, as long as there's some humidity there, there's always humidity in the pore space. There's always water. So, if the DNA can find itself uh, in those pores, it will bind to the walls of the pore and maybe then get stuck forever. You know. Yeah, and protected. But, but it's very important, I think, that then. The DNA analysis has some microstratigraphic control because, mm. again, you know, you first have to show that wherever you're getting the DNA, sedimentary DNA from, is not a context that has suffered a lot of processes, too many, so that then your DNA might not be from there. It might be leached from another layer or moved yeah. laterally. So that's where, for me, it gets very interesting. Yeah. Many open questions and a lot of work to do. Another question someone sent in is a general question that has always kept me thinking. When excavating caves, you have to sometimes dig meters deep into the ground to get to the old layers. Does this imply that the living surfaces used by, for example, Neanderthals were originally at these lower levels during their time? Or was the material at current level and simply got compressed? Oh, that's a very good question, because it's logical to think about compression. But normally there is no compression. It's amazing how how little there is of compression. You know, there's some, but generally, when I look at a thin section, the void space in there is true to the original conditions. So, for example, if you have worms going in there because in that time of the Neanderthals there was a forest, that the the holes left by those worms will still be there and we, they will be big and they're not compressed so everything is more or less the same uh, thickness when we have sediment when we have other things that are not sediment not like we have organic stuff or ash that all disappears and it gets very compressed but when there's soil which there's always soil then there's no compression so to go back to original curiosity or question when you start digging in a cave site, normally the layers are not that deep because actually cave sites and all sites, archaeological sites, normally most of them have been already found by other people, you know, in the past. And they has been, it's because it was found by accident or whatever. And they are usually not very far from the current surface. And when you start digging, already you pre, you find it. Sometimes maybe there's a layer of, for example, the recent period, you know, the Holocene, which be the last 10,000 years. And that is accumulation in a cave of uh, activities from shepherds that had their goats in the cave. 
and then maybe you have like a meter and a half of excrements of goats you have to take out, and then you have the Paleolithic floors. But the surprising thing is how deep they can go. That, yes, that is incredible The how much sometimes we excavate a Paleolithic site and we can go on and we have excavated 10 meters, which takes a long time also, you know, like 20 years, 10 meters, wow. and it still goes on. And, and it's 10 meters deep, that, yes. But that is because it's a lot of time. I mean, we are talking about the Paleolithic sequence can be hundreds of thousands of years of soil washing in, the roof collapsing and building up with more rocks. So then it builds up, but it's a long time. We have to think that it's a very long time. Thanks for explaining that. It was a good question. I like that one. Okay, due to time pressure, we have to move on to the he has quick takes. I'm sorry for the people who wrote in the questions. <laughs> so let's do the quick takes. As I told you, you can answer spontaneously or you can, of course, elaborate if you want. Okay, let's get started. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oh, wow. I should l be able to look through matter. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> like I look at a profile and I know what's inside already, like looking in. Yeah. And then, uh, yes, that's a time travel. Not <laughs> I would be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> or you could be ahead of all the researchers in your field. You just quickly go back, sneak peek and come back with a great conclusion, you know, because you have all the answers because you saw it. <laughs> a hobby of yours. Uh, music. Do you make music yourself? Yes. I figured I had an idea when you told me you have all the audio equipment. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Do you play an instrument? Yes. <laughs> Which one? I try. I, I, I try. I played really badly to play the guitar and a bit of keyboard, but I'm still learning. <laughs> I like that. Best piece of advice you've received or like to give yourself? Uh, don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. <laughs> Three words to describe yourself. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Never got that answer. Love it, though. Okay, the last question has been left for you uh, by one of our former guests from this podcast. And it says, if you could choose any other job besides the one you have, what would it be? The musician. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Uh, I'm looking out for songs that you'll be dropping in the future. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where can people find you online? Uh, on Spotify. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> With your new album. And we have a website for our lab. We Our lab is called AmbiLab. It's an archaeological micromorphology and biomarkers lab, so it's AmbiLab. And uh, we have a webpage there with our members, and we explain what we do. I put that into the show notes below mm. so people can look it sure. up. Yes. And you live in Tenerife. Yes. How is that? It yes. looks amazing. I've never been, but I just looked it up this morning. I was like, oh my God, beautiful. It's very nice weather. It's very calm, calm weather. Yes. Yeah. Not with amazing. too many seasons. All right. So is there anything you feel like you wanted to add or anything you feel like I didn't ask you? Uh, not really. I No, it was a very nice interview and I'm happy to to answer these questions. I don't know what else I could say, actually. No. I think we had a lovely conversation. Right. I learned a lot. Thanks for all this new information that I learned today. And thanks for sitting down with me for the Hey Ask podcast. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Hello again, Victoria here. If you enjoyed this episode or the podcast in general, please consider showing us your support by liking, sharing, and subscribing to our podcast on Spotify and YouTube. Your feedback and engagement mean the world to us and keep us going. Thank you for joining us on this journey and stay tuned for the next episode of the Heas Podcast.